So hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our webinar that Mary Barton and I are giving on our recent TEI or Total Economic Impact Study for Phrase. We're very excited to share the results. So here's how the talk will go today. I'm going to start by talking with you about the future of localization. And then Mary will go through and explain what is a TEI study. She'll summarize it, give some very interesting data about the customer journeys, share the study results, show how the financials worked out, and then we'll have a Q&A session. All right, are we good to go? So let's drop into this. At its core, localization is about customer experience. And 70% of B2B organizations say that improving customer experience, or CX, is a high or critical business priority this year. Well, we know that localization affects customer interactions at every step. In Forrester research, separate from the TEI study, here's what employees tell us about how they see localization supporting their business in the regions. They tell us that they see that it gives them better market access. It makes their companies appear more user-friendly and customer-centric. It definitely contributes to a more efficient and effective sales process. It's a competitive advantage. If you offer a great local, localized experience, then you always have an advantage over someone who doesn't. It saves time for regional employees. This is an under-recognized benefit of localization that when we're not doing it well as an organization, our regional employees have to compensate and create stuff themselves. And it also helps customers onboard faster so that they can start using the product and getting those utilization and occasionally consumables pull through numbers up. In this study, I asked people, as a buyer, how important was it to you to have a local language experience? And 75% of the respondents said they wanted to have a digital experience in their own language. And our research, our separate research shows that if people don't get a local language digital experience with your website, they're going to go use public tools to get the language translated for them, but those will be public tools that don't know anything about your branding or your voice. 73% said that they want the product itself to be in their language and to offer their data formats, their dates, units, currency. They just want it to be easy to work with. Two thirds say they want to speak with provider representatives in their own language. And about the same amount said they like to read sales and marketing materials in their own language. It's very useful to have local customer references. And over half say that they value having local thought leadership, showing the thought leaders that are relevant in their region. A key thing to remember about localization is that it varies. So this is not a universal statement about all cultures, all regions, all languages. These are general statements, but it's important to remember always that localization is about customer experience, and you should always check to see how important it is to your buyers. 70% of the B2B localization managers I spoke to said that they expect to localize more languages in, within two years, but less than half have the needed budget and resources. Let's take a look at what people are localizing. It's quite a lot of things. We see that well over half are translating their website. Written marketing and materials, unsurprisingly, over half translate their product user interface and documentation. Looking farther down the list, I was intrigued to see how non-written communications are becoming more prevalent in localization. Promotional videos are way up there, webinars, social media, blog posts, interactive content, chatbots, podcasts. Definitely, the future of localization is in AV just as much as in written materials. 
When we asked how, what languages people translate their websites into, this is what they told us. And I found this <laughs> uh, interesting, not surprising, and a little short-sighted, honestly, because these languages represent the socioeconomic reality of the past 50 years. And it reflects probably where our B2B buyers are right now. But let's just think about this. Hindi, Urdu, Bengali are used by over two times as many people as German and French, which are the top two and three languages that people told us they have their websites in. So what's going to happen within 10 to 15 years? Where are the B2B buyers of the future? When I speak to localization service providers or LSPs, which you may hear me say later, they're telling me that their largest company customers are looking to new markets in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in India, in areas of Central and South America, and looking at market expansion there. When I speak to customers who are really nailing localization, they consistently said to me that localizing expanded their market access in a region by a factor of three to four X. If we're going to win the buyers of the future, we need to think beyond what in localization we call EFIGS JCK, which stands for English, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, which are the very common, almost default languages that we translate into. We should be really thinking about who's, who's going to have that early mover or first mover advantage in these areas of the world that are not speaking those languages. Remember, only one in five people in the world speaks English and understands English. Four out of five don't, and there are B2B buyers in that, in that cohort. But let's talk about how this works, because uh, with localization, unfortunately, the devil really is in the details. We tend, when we're launching something like a product or doing a campaign, we tend to think of the content as something like this. All these different groups, digital, marketing, tech comms, the channel, legal, sales, they're all creating content. Back when I was a practitioner in industry, I did a time analysis once of a product launch. And at launch, there were 19 files from marketing for this product. Within two months, there were over 60 files. After six months, that had ballooned to over 200 files. Products and launches and campaigns, business activity generates content. And when you're localizing, multiply that by every language, plus all of the effort of maintaining and keeping all those languages updated and think about this content that comes from marketing, it's being reused in, for digital and regional and sales. Techcom's material is being reused all over the place. Tech support and channel are using materials for, that many other groups generate. There's a lot of reuse. And think, in most companies, these different groups, at least some of them are using different vendors, sometimes different large multinationals, sometimes different local agencies, freelancers, even internal people. In organizations over a billion, over a billion dollars, 25% of the people managing localization don't even know how many providers their companies are using. It's that decentralized. And what that means is if all these different groups are localizing material that is using the same imagery, the same terminology, the same boilerplate text, a lot of the same content, then it's being translated in a different way by each of those entities. Different, it'll be using synonymous terms that aren't the same. So decentralized localization is always a mess. It always dilutes your brand in every other language. And you get zero efficiencies of scale if you aren't managing it with centralized tools and coordination. So I wasn't surprised to hear that people were frustrated when I said, 
How well does your localization meet business needs? Over half said the quality was pretty good. So it's okay, could be better. Just over half said that the number of languages met their needs. Less than half, about two in five, said that the content, the localized content was always up to date. It's very easy for local language versions to slip behind the source versions, sometimes by quite a few versions. And unsurprisingly, just over a third said that localized materials were available in a timely fashion. How much of your revenue comes from customers who don't speak the same language that you're using at headquarters? How much of your revenue in five years is going to come from international customers? How well are you preparing for that reality? And given all this, I was surprised to see that so far only two in five of us are using translation workflow software to provide a central portal to access all the qualified translators, to provide unified glossaries, to provide consistent terminology, uh, shared translation memory, to provide uh, huge economies of scale, reuse, consistency, reviewer management, all kinds of stuff. This is a huge opportunity where we can jump our, our efficiency forward. And I say this, having managed localization for 25 years, the difference between managing all those quotes and file transfer via email, I even remember the days when we did it with FTP, and having translation workflow software, it's night and day. Just over a third of us are using machine translation. And there's still a lot of training issues because you can't just drop machine translation in and have it work instantly. About the same amount use software localization tools, which ensure that the software is localized along with the source language development. AV translation tools is still very early stage in penetration. And about the same amount, about a quarter, are using terminology management tools for content authoring to reduce variation, instill consistency, and therefore reduce translation cost, time, while improving quality. Technology, technology is the center. It is the future of localization. Localization used to be all about humans, purely human process, very manual. Human localizers can translate about 2,000, 2,500 words a day. That's a huge limit that gets in the way of us providing this local experience that our customers are demanding. It's technology that will get us to where we need to be. Localization is now an extremely technical function. The future that I see for localization is technology driven, it is connected, and it is everywhere. B2C buyers already just expect they'll be able to see everything on the web in their own language. Agile development cycles, there's no such thing now as having quarterly release cycles, um, translating stuff, you know, after you, after you launch and then you wait three to six months to have it available in language and then you update it every couple of quarters or every year, that just does not work in today's agile development cycles. You've got to have agile localization. It used to be that uh, when you sent your content off for localization, it basically went into a black box. You had no idea what the localization <laughs> vendor did with it. And now the LSPs tell me that their customers are demanding a lot more transparency and speed and control. They want their providers to work together. They want the ability to choose their own translators and to see what's happening. And of course, AI is the word of the week with chat to, uh, GPT. I'm not seeing that we're suddenly going to have multilingual AI generated content taking over everything we need, though that's probably down, down the road, but it is playing a major role right now in workflow automation. AI is super good at 
taking stuff that is tedious and repetitive for humans and automating it. That will help us get the scale that we need. I'm also seeing a real change to doing localization for a reason. What I've seen in many marketing organizations is that you just decide, okay, we're going to do the website in eFigs, JCK, remember that? And also the marketing collateral, and then occasionally we'll do stuff in some other languages when, when there's a need. And then you sort of decide that and then go. The companies I speak to who are really getting localization as a business, a business investment, they have a VP or C-level officer who is overseeing this modern holistic tech stack, who is coordinating it so we don't get that, that word salad that we saw earlier, all of that inconsistency, all of that delay and cost. They're not doing localization as an afterthought after all the source language stuff is finished and launched. They're thinking, they're incorporating localization into their planning and their design so that they're global from the get go. And LSPs tell me that they're increasingly seeing that startups are starting to eat the big companies lunch because the startups understand that localization is a cost of doing business and they're going to market for the first time in 30 languages. They aren't weighed down by the, the quote, the content debt that we big organizations have. They haven't got thousands of, of files in a backlog that aren't translated. They just go to market in 30 languages using machine translation as well as human. And so they're much better able to compete with these incumbent large multinationals who thought they had a lock on the local markets. And it used to be that we would measure localization by what our reviewers, our in-country reviewers said about the quality, which often was not very positive, frankly. And um, we would treat it as a cost. But say with supply chain, we don't just talk about supply chain in terms of how much it costs to have fleet maintenance and local warehouses. We talk about the impacts on customers, on time to promise, Do what's the cost of poor quality? What's the value of delivering on time? What I'm seeing is a real change to deciding how to localize and what to localize based on does it work? Does it change the behavior? Quality and localization is not a single unquestioned shining hill, city on a hill standard. If localized content increases event registrations, if it increases buyer engagement, if it reduces support calls, if it increases product use, then it is good quality. It's good quality enough. And these behavioral insights and process maturity tracking will become in, will increasingly displace these fairly meaningless quality and cost metrics. There's a whole new world of localization management ready for us. For those of us who are thinking about customer experience among our customers who don't speak the same language as us, those of us who are looking at expanding into new markets. And at this point, I will hand it over to Mary Barton to tell you about the TEI study that we did with Phrase. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, I'm Mary Barton. I'm with the TEI team here at Forrester, and I am lucky enough to have experts like Kathleen to consult with on uh, as a subject matter expert, and she's been very helpful on this study. She's uh, participated in every step of the way, so she's very familiar with the material that I'm about to cover, and I'm probably going to ask her to join with me in a couple of comments and, and relay some of her, what she remembers hearing from customers. But the first thing I have to do being from the TEI team is give a disclosure that says that you should be aware of the following, that this is an independent study. The customer names for the interviews were provided by Phrase, but Phrase did not participate in those interviews. Forrester does not endorse Phrase or any other company. And this is just a, a neutral third party study. So, 
what I'd like to do is build on what Kathleen has said by looking at this next slide with the, a quote that's representative of what we heard from the people that we interviewed. Each of them had a different story to tell us about the, the role of the translation team had changed and expanded. All of them reported that they had a much greater impact on the business and a more central role than before their company had engaged with Phrase. So what I'd like to do as we prepare for this is, again, I'm going to assume that many of you in the audience are not familiar with the TEI methodology, so I'll go over that first. Next, we'll take a high-level look at the results of our analysis before we begin looking at the story behind the customer decision to engage with Phrase. We'll review the key challenges that customers face before the partnership with Phrase, and I'll conclude by sharing some specifics about how customers reported that they benefited from their work with Phrase. And on the next slide, Forrester, I just want to go through the background. Forrester has been conducting TEI studies for over 20 years. The TEI methodology allows us to develop a business use case in a consistent, repeatable way by considering the benefits, the costs, the flexibility, and the risk that an organization sees with their technology investment. As a third-party objective analysis, we use standard financial methods and terms, and they're outlined in the approach to the full study. This presentation is just an abridged version of that. If you're interested in the full study, I'm sure Phrase has a link to that somewhere in the chat today. On the approach, the next slide we're going to talk about we begin with due diligence, and that was my first contact with Kathleen. She was one of the first conversations I had. Tell me about translation management. Tell me about localization. And fortunately, as she said, she had plenty of practitioner experience to lend to the study. And then I, can, I did a due diligence research cover. We talked to people within Phrase, the key stakeholders at Phrase, and got their opinion. From that, we conducted a customer interview. And we spoke with these people about the benefits that they were seeing based on the things that we knew ahead of time. From that, we develop a composite organization. It's not one individual company that's represented in the financial, but more of a generic overview based on the numbers that we heard from the people in the study. From that, we wrote the study. While Phrase had the opportunity to review the study, Forrester remains maintained editorial control. And just for an accuracy check, we also send out the study before publication to all of those who were interviewed to make sure that we haven't misconstrued anything they've said. We give them an opportunity to give us their feedback. Next, we'll cover the people that we interviewed. We talked to five representatives from organizations that have been using phrase for a long enough period of time that they can report on it, on the benefits that they've seen. And that, I think the average here was a full three years. Um, we talked to people who were translating as few as $2 million, $2 million words a year, as many as 50 million words per year. Our composite is, is on the high end of that. The next slide I believe covers the characteristics. So uh, let's hit with the three-year impact. So we'll go to the bottom line first. The ROI on the investment for our typical customer was 527%, which is an astounding number. But what you can understand from that and what from what Kathleen said, many of these people, the majority of these customers had come from semi-manual or fully manual. One of the interviewed customers had been using a different product and had switched to phrase. But there's a lot of efficiencies gained when you automate the systems. So we spoke with- Yeah, I should say, Mary, sorry to pop in, but yeah. so many of the customers I speak to at Forrester, they're still, they're still getting their quotes via email they're sending files by email. It's incredibly manual and slow. Sometimes they use their market resource management software to manage the project, but the, that 527 
percent ROI is not surprising when you look at where a lot of us start. Right. There's enormous efficiency gains going from manual to automated. Well, and you'll remember this particular customer who gave us this quote. She said it, the first thing they did was they assembled a team to do a survey of what they had and, and get a list of the requirements that people had and just get organized in order to be able to make a transition. But they said from all of the requirements, from all of the different departments, that scatter dot graph that you showed us earlier, all of those parties contributing, saying, this is what we'd like to have. Phrase had the tools that fit the best with the requirements across the board. She said it wasn't every answer for every person, but across the board, it met the most, um, most needs that were stated by that, that group. So I believe on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about how we did this analysis. The prior challenges that these people were seeing was that they had legacy systems that they, they just couldn't modernize, as we've talked about at length here. With those manual processes and the, the limitations of an individual, as Kathleen said, about the number of words that can be translated in today, they just did not have enough personnel to manage it. Most of the people we talked to had a huge backlog of materials that were waiting to be processed prior to their engagement with Phrase. They had no ability to customize their workflow processes. They had these large catalogs of un, untranslated materials. And it was just impossible for employees to do self-service, which is a, a key benefit that we saw from Phrase. The solutions requirements that the people that we spoke to said they needed is on the next slide. Uh, they wanted absolutely the workflow automation was number one and self-service capabilities. They wanted people across the organization to be able to request and manage the workflow of their own translations. Obviously, they wanted a cloud-based solution, partly because of the access to, but also the scalability. That was the, the other key factor with these backlogs of material everybody said, we need to scale. We can't do it with our methods. We can't do it with our personnel. We need some technology to help us scale. So that's what drove them to look to phrase. So on the next slide, here we go with the composite. We had, we framed this around a company that had one primary source language of English as most of our, our, our customers did, with about 35 destination languages. In the first year, they translate, after phrase, they translated 30 million words per year. And we grew that in our model to 40 million words translated per year. This is reflective of the numbers that we saw from the customers and their growth patterns. The interesting thing to say, here that's not in the model, in year zero, they were translating a fraction of that many words per year. So the, the first year, they had a huge jump in the ability to increase their capacity. So what did we find from this? That's a, let's get into the numbers now. The three-year risk-adjusted benefits. So Forrester applies a time value of money discount, and we also add a risk adjustment to account for variances in all kinds of things. All of this is spelled out in intimate detail in the study in their Excel tables, which I won't bore you with today, but the total benefits for the composite organization was just over $3 million in three years. The first benefit is detailed on the next slide, the reduced translation costs. Sorry about that. That's all scroll, right. Scroll um, wheel there. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> there were several contributing factors that led to the savings and costs from improved visibility into the cost of a translation project ahead of time, um, improved translation memories, even in an organization that claimed to have an extensive existing translation memory prior to engaging phrase, they reported an increase in that. 
they to centralize systems that avoided that duplication of effort and consistency across translations, reducing the need to translate uh, all, more words. And finally, just to the, the improvement of machine translation. And as this uh, customer said, they get more leverage out of that translation memory, which means they pay less money for new transmissions. And they said, you know, because now it's all in one repository, they can look across it and look for those inconsistencies. And Kathleen, I'm sure this is true of what you see with the people that you speak with, both in light of this oh, phrase, yes. study, but also just in light of your research. Yes, I, I was very intrigued by the customers we spoke to for this study. I remember one of them saying that they saw a clear impact on revenue. And what they saw was that increasing their localization for them, it increased regional sales by $50 million. They also saw a strong uptick in online sales and much higher event registrations in Asia Pacific. One thing that was always problematic to me as previously a practitioner working in regulated markets, was that the countries that had the highest required translations, many of them in the European Union, had less of a need for localization than some of the customers who were in countries that didn't require it. And so our budget got sucked up by the EU and we didn't have, we couldn't do what our Asian customers really needed us to do always until we were able to get the scale from this kind of, of efficiency. And another cu customer mentioned that before phrase, they couldn't compare quotes. It simply was too, too onerous and time consuming. They said, we just had to move ahead and get the invoice at the end of the month. <laughs> That's right. I remember her telling me that it took weeks just to get the, yeah. the estimate in. So they, they just had the, it, they would have had the estimate after the time they needed the translated material. So they just had to yes. pull the trigger and just go. So yeah. the additional benefit to that that we can't quantify here, though, is that with that ability to forecast costs, and we're going to cover this a little bit in the unquantified benefits, that same person reported that managers would not, they wouldn't even put something forward to be translated because, oh, it'll be too expensive and why would we do that? But now with their self-service ability to look at the estimated cost ahead of time, they're actually branching out into a broader set of materials that they're translating mm -hmm. and, find, and they're finding a business impact from that. Um, yeah. So, the, the next one's also pretty interesting. I, I think this one is broader. That The next one is the workflow and process improvement. This has a small number here relative to the other, but I think what's not being captured here is, again, that when that time is freed up, both on the, the translations team and within the different departments, again, back to your scatter plot, um, people have more time to do other things. So what we're capturing here is the actual time saved by translation managers, period. That's, that's all that went into this. And they're saying that they saw a 25 to 30% reduction in the time that it took translation managers to move materials through the translation process. Mm -hmm. It does not capture the value of those activities that those translation managers turned their attention to with that time saved. And they said, this was a, a big part of that original quote that we put up about assuming a broader role within the organization, including strategic efforts and innovation and thinking about those problems that Kathleen was putting up earlier, and what should we be thinking about? Rather than just constantly trying to manage a backlog, they were actually doing their job beyond just getting material translated. They also talked about, you know, just the continuing need for process improvement. And again, reaching back to Kathleen's talk about keeping up with agile development. 
when they needed to create a new template in their previous solution, they'd have to go to that solution provider and go back and forth with the team. And they'd take weeks and months to get these things done. And then with phrase, when they want to add a new file format or a type of content, they just set it up in the portal and then they they go on. They say, one of them said, we do it in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. So that was really important. So I know you've probably got something to add here too, because this is such a oh, yeah. key part of what you were talking about earlier. Yes. The customers were were saying that they saw that all of a sudden they were getting 24-7 work because the file transfer and the QC were managed and were able to occur during their off hours in other time zones. An interesting benefit that I saw was that a couple of them reported seeing a huge drop in software quality issues because there were far fewer broken strings, missing files, and bugs. And there are ways to quantify that, but they're not represented here in this, in this OPEX number. Another benefit to OPEX was that they were able to eliminate a number of duplicative technologies for management. Right. Uh, well, and not many of them actually had ways to measure that, which is why we yeah. couldn't, we couldn't include it in the study. Um, and that's why we always include a section on those unquantified benefits. And we have some thoughts, too, about how we might begin to capture these benefits and, and quantify them in the future. So let's talk a little bit about those unquantified benefits that we saw. As a experienced TEI consultant, I can tell you that I have interviewed many customers, and these customers were no different, who say that they believe that the unquantified benefits exceed the value of the quantified benefits that we're able to actually build a spreadsheet around because we have data and we can, we can do that. The enhanced scalability to enable growth. It's hard to say how much of that is due to phrase and how much of it is due to some other factor. So it's not quantifiable, but they know without phrase, it wouldn't be possible. So that's a, an unquantified benefit that everyone in the, or everyone that we interviewed, this was across the board. I'll the, mention right there before, sorry to cut <laughs> yeah. in, but there was one, I loved what one customer said, uh, where she said the in-house, our in-house linguists could not have scaled. And I said, if you'd still been using Excel, how would that have worked? And she said, it would have been a disaster. That's right. That's Just a disaster. A disaster. I do remember that. Um, and and I think we asked the same thing of someone else. And she said, we just, we couldn't, it would not, yeah. it, it just wouldn't work. It would just, it's just impossible. So um, that goes back again to this expanded role and impact of the translation team as these customers that we interviewed reported that as managers began to see the value of translating other materials, the opportunity to serve a broader function within the organization, and I use an example that we've talked about a couple of times internally, one of our customers was facing a difficult time staffing their warehousing and uh, shipping and uh, manufacturing departments, Pro mostly because they felt like they weren't able to convey to their potential hires, who many times don't speak English, what the benefits were that would be available to them as an employee. So it was part of their recruiting materials. Now they were translating oh, yes. documents so that they could explain benefits to even potential employees. Then they also had seen a problem when those employees came to work and their instructions and their job descriptions were in English. Many of them quit even after just a day because they were so frustrated at not knowing what they were supposed to do. So translating those materials so that it was recruitment and retention of critical employees in this pandemic, post-pandemic period for them. This was super important. Yeah, no way to measure it, though. No way for us to understand it. Well, in another study that I did, I'll say that a couple of customers 
talked to me about how when they started translating their sales training materials, they saw an enormous uh, return on investment because the reps were better able to upsell and cross-sell. And in one, in one market, they were able to make the case that a $1 million investment in training, this was a very large multinational, um, they saw a, an uptick in $500 million of sales with the, the sales reps who had been trained in local language. So it that was a very big impact, but it wasn't, it was a very common impact, possibly not at that scale, but that pattern of employees who are trained in local language are better equipped to succeed. Well, and certainly that is across the board. And obviously um, these people who are trained in their own language internally, even in warehousing and shipping, that could be a huge cost if people don't know how to do their jobs. So that was that was an important one that we we know is very large, but we just can't quantify it at this time. We've got some ideas about how we might work with people to understand how they could capture that. But and then again, we have this improved ability to forecast and control translation costs, which led to the follow on which is that managers are realizing that they have the potential to translate more materials uh, into more languages. It's not as expensive as they thought with the ability to forecast, they can make an informed decision about how to prioritize what they're translating and, and when it's gonna come out. Huge impact on the business to have better knowledge about what they're doing with those materials. Yeah. Fun. Go ahead. I'm oh, sure. we saw that <laughs> with one customer, they uh, two customers had specific numbers on the change from 100% human translation or HT to human plus machine translation. And one of them went from 100% HT to 52% HT and 48% machine translation or MT. And another went from 100% HT to 60%, 60%, I'm going to throw all the initialisms at you, so you sound like an expert, MTPE, which stands for Machine Translation Plus Post Edit by a Human. Um, <laughs> so that's a, a way of getting a lot of the benefits of human look, human brains with the speed of machine translation. So this one other customer went from 100% HT to 60% MTPE, 10% raw MT, and 30% HT. Raw machine translation is the kind of thing that often works well in things like your user community, your forums, where people don't really care about having polished prose. They just want to get the, the idea. They just need the gist of what's being said. And I want to also just mention what you said about the enhanced scalability. Several of the customers talked about how this actually reduced the number of people they had to hire. So one of them said that Phrase enabled them to reduce their localization headcount from 16 people to three, even while they doubled the localization volume because it cut localization management time and review time, raised quality because it was just so much more efficient. And another one said, if I hadn't had phrase, I'd have had to hire five more people to do repetitive, error-prone manual tasks and the time to market would have suffered. Right. So that's the other, the final thing that we just talked about, these mundane repeated tasks taking those off the plate of the translation managers. The other aspect of the increased employee satisfaction is from those yes. managers in the other departments now having more knowledge, more control, more ability and self-determination about how their translation projects are managed because they're submitting them themselves. They're managing them. The translation managers keep an eye on everything. And if anything goes wrong, if there's an exception, they step in. But for the most part, these things operate very smoothly. Yeah, it moves from that thing where everyone who wants in translation has to submit it to the localization manager. It goes into a black box. The quote seems to take forever. 
the translation comes back, you don't like it, you review it, there are review cycles. Eventually, three months later, you get your translation. And now people are just able to self-serve. And it's all going through qualified vendors and a repeatable, scalable process with quality metrics and data that help them build a record of what sort of behavior changes it it uh, drives on the website and so on from uh, from other analytics. That's so fine. it just turned it turned a very old fashioned manual process into a modern automated process. That's right. So the last thing we have to think about when we're doing a TEI, we've talked about all these great benefits. And now the answer, the question is how? So how much does this thing cost? Uh, not very much. Um, as you can see here, it's a little over 500,000, including the phrase fees and the implementation and support. The implementation and support is not expensive. One of our uh, customers said when they were trying to get people up and running, one of the costs would be training. How do you train people to use this? They said, you know, we give them a, a few minutes of training. They have to know what they need translated. How, you know, they have to have some way to pay for it. They have to tell us what they want translated and what they want it translated to. And, and, but it's all very easy and they're up and running. So the big, the big um, changeover costs don't really happen so much with this because it happens pretty smoothly. The cost, I think, is, is, uh, a couple of our customers said it depends a little bit on where you are, but, it's something you're going to have to do anyway, which is get your your translation library sorted. So um, with that in mind, the financial summary, this last thing we're going to talk about, and then we'll open it up for questions. Just a reminder that this had a net present value of 2.67 million to the composite organization and the composite reflective of the customers we interviewed saw a return on their investment of 527%. And with that, I will open it for questions and remind you again, the details of all of these calculations are laid out very specifically in the study, which um, you can obtain from Phrase. Great. And I'm going to see if I can increase the cameras. Here we go. I didn't want to have all of us showing, you know, and changing around during the talk, but now that we're switching to customers, uh, to Q&A, we can just put it all up. So, all right. Okay, so that first question I think is for me. Um, it is pretty impressive, that 527%, and we don't really see very many uh, technologies that get that kind of a return. I can unpack it a little bit. And again, the, all of the detail for that is in the study. We lay out exactly how much a person is paid and, and we discount it uh, back to a present value. And um, I, I hope that maybe throughout this presentation, you get a little bit of an answer to that question. And I think, uh, Georg, I think you have uh, someone that, uh, can at phrase that customers or interested people can contact about this? Yeah, absolutely. We've put uh, a link to the study in the chat and also an email address, info at phrase.com. And we'll make sure that you know people can talk to us about our uh, uh, what we found here and our approach as well. And I th my, my sense also of this 527, as impressive as it is, so it's it, we did reflect in, in your comments on what it doesn't include. And it's it it's that lovely point around the 50 million of extra sales. And as Kathleen said, couldn't have happened without. And in it, those kinds of unlocking moments are pretty important. And uh, yeah, if you know, let, let me know when's the right moment to jump in. I've got a few thoughts on this maturity curve from manual spreadsheets to automation to machine translation and um and and how one manages this this flow between the enterprise and the LSP and what, what can be done there. So well, I think that. Now's a great time because what we're talking about here, this ROI encompasses all, that's exactly what it's capturing is, and we did not mention in the presentation that many of those LSPs are also on the system. So it's a smooth transition yeah. from and back and forth. 
I think this is one of the extremely exciting areas for us as a business is that we have a lot of LSP customers and enterprise customers. And in fact, when both sides of that transaction are using our uh, technology stack, there's a, a, a very high degree of visibility on quality, cost and time. And that works to the benefit of both sides of, of that, the enterprise and the LSP. And um, it allows both sides to optimize either the service delivery or the reception of that service delivery. So I think for, you know, one of the big objectives that we had in working with Forrester on this study and in, in our own work that we're doing is trying to bring more of a business value conversation and vocabulary and the data to support it so that all of our colleagues and customers with uh, localization remit can better articulate to the executives in their businesses why those budgets should be maintained or increased and what the return on that investment is. So for us, it's 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 the technology that allows you know a job to be uh, visibly and transparently followed all the way through and the controls that we put around that. But it's also the work we're doing um, to allow the data of localization to be combined with business data. And then for all of that to have some analytics and some automated uh, triggers, triggering workflows off the back of that. And I think that's very exciting. Now, um, the, uh, in the nature of these studies is, of course, this took place over the last few months. As we've discussed offline, um, there are developments that we'll be talking about in the next month or so that actually will probably turbocharge us even future with a greater degree of automation not to announce those today, but to give the audience a little sort of taster and a tickle mm -hmm. of, of what to look forward to um, with our announcements in February. But uh, I think the, the 527, to the extent that that represents the, the journey from manual spreadsheet to, if you like, the first evolution of automated workflows, I think we're going to see in the next month and what we're announcing there, the next stage of that evolution to you know seriously advance automation off the back of very granular data. And then, you know, MT... Before if I can say, before you jump into your slides, I wanted to address, because I've got an answer that can tick off three of these questions here. <laughs> and you mentioned the evolution, the evolving role of translators, this concern about will they have to become post editors? And to my mind, and from what I'm seeing from the LSPs, it's all about scale, because the problem that we have in localization as localization customers is that we need to do five to 10 times more than we are doing now. Machine translation is what enables us to do that. that. But humans will always be at the center of, of localization. So the way I think of automation is the same way I think about modular content and chat GPT and so on, is it takes off all of the tedious manual kind of low brain level parts of my job as a thought person that frankly I don't enjoy doing and it enables me to focus on the stuff that really requires my brain so I like vendors like Lilt, uh, Vistatech who I mean I like lots of LSPs but those are a couple of the ones who have really talked about keeping humans at the center of translation so I see the the translator as becoming even more of a quality leader because they're doing the core quality work that then feeds into the MT to enable that huge scale we need. Uh, you're asking about other studies and documents by Forrester. Uh, the study I did on the future of localization is going to be published, uh, I think, at the end of this week. So Forrester customers will be able to access that. And I have it on my note on my list to do a blog about it as well with some really interesting questions. And then lastly, I'll just mention the evolving role of localization managers or C-level leaders uh, dealing with this, common places for it, marketing and CX. Those are the most common places I see it located. There are some variations, some organizations with very strong knowledge management, enterprise content groups may have it there. But CX, customer experience and marketing are the most likely places. However, it should be treated as an enterprise coordinating function wherever it's located. Mary, did you wanna? Uh, I'm looking at the last question there. I'd be curious to learn the difference in ROI 
and total economic impact of implementing phrase and any other localization solution. We do not do comparison studies, and I'm not aware of a TEI of a competitor. I'm, I'm, there may be one, but I'm not aware of there it. Are. Okay, well, I, some of the things, some of the things I hear, um, there are some good competitors out there. I believe com competition makes us all stronger. Some of the things that I hear are, of course, there are cost differences. Some solutions are better for different scale and complexity of, of, you know, whether you're optimized for enterprise or for other areas. A lot of it is about personal fit, just like any other B2B purchase. You know, you want to pick the company that you have the best relationship with. And I've heard some comments about differences in just quality and ease of use. But I've heard I've heard good things about every vendor in this market. But I've heard a lot of good things about Phrase from my customers. I have not spoken to those other people. I've spoken to Phrase customers. So. I think if I was going to comment on that point, what I'd say is that there is a relatively small number of vendors that are good at enterprise. Yeah. There's a slightly broader range of vendors that are good at SME. There is an extremely short list, and I'd say it's probably just us, that's good at both enterprise and LSP. And specifically, what I mean by that is not necessarily that we're good for the enterprise and good for the LSP separately, <clears throat> specifically in being good when those two things are connected. So when you have an enterprise and an LSP both using our platform to pass jobs between them, that's a unique capability we've invested in and are continuing to do so. There's one uh, data point which we discussed in our preparatory conversations that I think is quite interesting and sometimes overlooked as people evaluate the ROI of these solutions. And it's that um, Slater have this number that the global um, uh, uh, industry represents approximately $26 billion of annual spend. And that approximately 1 billion of that goes into TMS and CAT tools and string management on the mm -hmm. software type tools. So a, a billion on software and 25 on human translation. That's approximately the ratio. So if you're a, an enterprise and you spend $1 on software, if you believe that number, then $25 are going on human translation services. So the, the point I think that I would I take from that is that if you spend that dollar wisely, you can optimize the other $25 that you're spending. So you're getting the very best quality translation based on domain and language pair. And the right software will help you optimize the other side of it. So that $1 can help you optimize the other $25. And that's why this connection between the enterprise and the LSP is so important. And in that, we you mentioned a few names. I won't because we are strictly vendor neutral. We work with seven of the top 10 LSPs in the world. So we, you know, they're we, all good. We're favorites. Um, mm -hmm. They're all good. But um, many big enterprises, of course, work with more than one. And as you said, competition mm -hmm. makes it good. And so that's, I think, where we can yeah. help optimize the $25. I, one of the first blogs I wrote at Forrester. Uh, was one where I said uh, choosing a localization partner or an LSP is like dating in the sense that I always found that a vendor who was absolutely perfect for me at one company was not necessarily great for me at another. And sometimes vendors that other people just where they sang their praises to the skies and I would try them and it was a complete failure. It is so personal, the match between you and your localization vendor. And so... Right. Yeah. But let me just interject too with what just to support what you just said, Georg, because one of your customers did tell us mm -hmm. and it didn't make it into the unquantified benefits, but one of the one of the things that she really liked about it was that connection and that the LSPs that she wanted to use were also using phrase. So that it made it that seamless interaction mm -hmm. between the two. And th th these are LSPs that they had um, long-standing relationships with and, and felt like they knew their company, they knew the ins and outs, and that, you know, that was very important to them to be able to continue to use them for their very um, deep understanding of the, sort of their culture and the way they like to represent themselves and how that came through in the translations. So, um, yeah. That's it. And I like this question here about 36% using machine translation. Biggest challenges. One of these challenges is just that the, the generic libraries don't work equally well. 
think of think of just if you're speaking English and you send stuff out for edit, how much do people comment on it and edit it and change it? Multiply that. Uh, as this is an area where a lot of money is going into it. So we're seeing a gr an explosive growth in libraries. So libraries that are aimed at say verticals like life sciences or financial services, horizontals like marketing voice or versus engineering ver voice versus legal. So the growth of these libraries is helping. A few of the LSPs I spoke to, I believe it was one of the gentlemen at RWS, another really good firm, I think the biggest one, uh, was that there's a real concern about the computing, the ecological footprint, because so much translation is of the same stuff. And yet this is IP. And so it's held very tightly. People don't share their translation memories with their competitors or with anyone. And yet there's huge amounts of computing power that go to maintaining enormous translation memories that have enormous overlap. And, and, and really the use of MT was not included in the context of this study, yeah. um, but it is uh, a capability that we have, we are working on. And what we see that is so powerful is the combination of um, translation memories and MT working together. So mm -hmm. uh, a generic yes. MT engine on its own, much less accurate than one that combines the language IP of the, of the particular customer. So that combination, um, when you have you know long working history and language IP inside an enterprise with MT, is very 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 powerful. And um, yeah. and I think also it's knowing when to use it and having the confidence to use it. So you mentioned raw MT and mm -hmm. user generated content can work quite well. in, for example, uh, if you've got a big uh, support help desk, and you mm -hmm. may have some articles that are. Um, used relatively less frequently and you might have an automated trigger that says once an article is used you know over a certain threshold then let's pop that up for human post editing but anything under that can be raw machine translated you can use some intelligence like mm -hmm. that to do things in a highly automated way at scale right which i think that the person arcadio has mentioned a number of other yes of business value which i think is great mm -hmm. you know, very good stuff you, yeah, with machine translation, you just you have to commit to training it. It's like an employee almost. And so if you don't invest in training it, or if you don't luck out and get a good engine, then the results may not be good. But I had a matrix that I showed in our last year for Forrester B2B Summit that said the you have this the vertical axis of low volume, high volume, the horizontal of less unique, more unique. So like highly unique content, like customer stories, landing pages, ads, those low volume, they need human translation. They need that focused attention. Stuff that is that is lower volume, but less unique, like documentation, a lot of your product web pages. It needs to be good quality, but there's a high level of reuse. You can use machine translation plus post edit for a lot of that. Then you've got the um, less unique, but high volume, uh, things like these uh, tech support, um, a lot of your less used web pages uh, and user forums, high volume, very unique, slang misspellings. Up, the, up there, you're using more of the machine, sometimes raw machine translation, because it's more important to have any translation than to have the right translation. That's it. And that's yeah. the, exactly, totally agree. And that's where we see that combination of TMS and MT working together yeah. with automation, um, with a high degree of automation and really granular data coming out, combining that data with business data, whether it's dollars, clicks, uh, visits, whatever it might be, to, to ultimately be able to show the business why this area deserves more investment. That's what we're trying to build that platform. Yeah. I think the, the thing to be aware of with MT is just to pick it very carefully because it's, it is it is not a thing. There is not like machine translation. It's more like machine translation, you know, all these different vendors and libraries and engines and all kinds of stuff. And it's growing very rapidly. I think yeah, anyone we, who wants to see the complexity should go and check out the, the NIMSI language uh, technology atlas yeah. n i m is in mother d is in dog z i is in intelligent 
It's very, it's very good, but as we say, it wasn't in the study, and you may not know yeah. that our machine translation offering is actually offering mm -hmm. a range of third-party vendors, and again, yeah. take a neutral approach. So we analyze domain and language pair, and then provide always the best quality. So uh, as as well as our own engines. Very useful. <laughs> it, helping to, helping to recommend the best one. Yeah. Exactly. So we're providing that as well. Yeah. Um, which and which again is, is is interesting because wasn't in the study. So that five hundred and twenty-seven, no. you know. Doesn't Maybe even it, that. It, it'll be fresh. It'll be. <laughs> you know. Oh boy. All right. Yeah, I like I like Mr. Andra Andrade's comments. Very good stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, Georg, it's been a real pleasure working with your team on this study. And um, I see that we've run over our time a little bit. Um but it's been a pleasure being here today. And thanks, Kathleen, for all your help along the way on this study. And um, hope mm -hmm. to work with you again. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having us on this webinar. And Likewise. bye, everyone. Thank you. All the best. Bye.